great. Screen recording wasn't working, but now it is, so great. Um, okay, just to recap for everybody who who's uh, going to be tuning into this after the fact, uh, second iteration of our uh, Technical Tuesday section, we're going to be doing deployment in Ether, discovery and coverage in the Ether platform, configuration management in Ether, and patch management. Great, so uh, we'll dive right in, I think. So I will share my screen again. And what we'll do is we will have a look at uh, one of our demo consoles. So uh, logging into our console here, this is uh, not necessarily accurate in terms of a real world scenario, but it's, it's a good indicator of, uh, of you know, how the console uh, will look in the end. Now what we want to do is look at the deployment in the pocket. Now traditionally, uh, you would have a deployment tool that you would download to do remote deployments. Uh, you would run this tool on a server and the server would um, you know, discover devices and push out the agent that way. Um, you can download the agent manually as well. And in the Ether console, it's a little bit tricky. You go to computers, uh, you then go to this add a computer button in the top right hand side uh, and that will drop down the download page for the agents uh, from various operating systems. Now, when using the, um, the product this way, if you're going to download an agent, let's say you download the Windows agent, maybe you select a select a, uh, a profile that you'd like the agent to represent. Uh, you can then actually download the installer. And it's a it's a couple of megs files. It's really uh, nothing too um, too hectic. And this agent is what you would use to deploy to your workstation. So if you are using an existing software deployment tool uh, then this is what you would uh, this is what you would use now um, if you would like to do a remote deployment you can uh, click on the discover and remote installation and it will give you instructions on how to get this set up so uh, there's two components to this uh, the first component is the uh, the discovery and the second component is the actual deployment now, I'm going to cover the discovery just in the next section when we actually look at the settings. So, we'll skip ahead and look at the deployment, which is where you would view unmanaged devices. So, uh, these are discovered devices that are resident on the network that do not have the Panda agent deployed. Now, uh, the devices here could uh, represent devices that perhaps aren't supported by our platform. So, we'll actually uh, discover uh, as many unprotected devices on your network as possible and this would cover not only just workstations and servers but uh, mobile devices uh, potentially uh, networking hardware um, all that kind of stuff it will get you know uh, flagged in this in this list uh, and here you can see there's actually quite a lot of them so uh, normally what you would do if you were going to maintain coverage is you would actually access this list slightly differently uh, you would likely just access this list from the status page. So when you first log into the product, this is the status page that you'll see. You'll actually see that there's a red exclamation mark that will highlight discovered devices. Uh, and you can just click on this link and it'll show you a list of all the devices that have been, um, that have been discovered. This is most likely, especially long term, how you will be accessing this list. Now what you can then do is select the devices you would... Uh, like to deploy to, you just check the checkbox. Um, right now, only Microsoft-based devices are supported in the in the platform for remote deployment. That is um, right. So you selected your devices. Uh, you can then click on install the Panda agent. Now it'll let you install the agent directly into a group of your choosing. Uh, there are different ways that you can do the install group. Some people do it uh, on a per group basis. Some people create a specific install group and then all the devices get installed there. And once they're reflecting the console, they can be moved elsewhere. It's, it's up to you how you would like to approach this. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you would then uh, select your group. And then here, you would actually enter your admin credentials. So... Um, Sorry, not change the settings. So it would be like a domain, 
backslash you know admin and you would enter your password whatever it is um, and you would click on install and it's going to generate an install job for the devices now you will see immediately this icon has changed to installing this is likely to fail in this demo environment because we don't actually have access the the devices are booted up every day and then shut down so it's going to flag as a as an error and that's quite important so i'd like to show you what happens when that takes place so we'll give this a minute to actually run uh, you'll see there's one here that uh, is already in an error state and that's great so if there's a problem like let's say the device is off at the time or um, maybe there is a firewall uh, from the previous protection uh, or something like that enabled what you can do is click on the error message and it'll actually give you an idea of you know when the problem occurred so this was slightly different this is early hours of this morning and uh, it's got a link to indicate that uh, uh, there's an issue with the remote installation requirement so you can click on this link and it's going to run through uh, the uh, the requirements to perform a remote deployment. We will hide. Okay, great. Sorry, guys. Uh, little interruption in network connectivity. Not sure what's what that was about, but we are we're back. So I'll share my screen again. Wow. Okay. okay great. Okay, so here are the requirements. Uh, the requirements are uh, they're not too hectic. Generally speaking, they're along the same lines as uh, what you would what could be typical for other remote uh, uh, deployments. Um, there are some ports and protocols that will be need to be allowed. So if you're running like a third party firewall, that kind of thing, uh, you will need to um, you know, add these ports uh, in. You need the admin share. This is very important. Uh, and this will mean that you can't actually use the remote deployment in things like work group uh, environments, unless of course you actually go and, and enable this the admin share uh, in the domain type setting this will actually be uh, uh, enabled by default of course you will need credentials to do so so either you need the devices admin credentials in the case of like a work group deployment or the domain admin credentials um, uh, which uh, yeah so again fairly standard for remote deployment um, scenario Cool, and then there are a couple of other requirements around network discovery, that kind of thing. Uh, this is, um, again, uh, fairly typical. There is a, a caveat here for other considerations, and this we encounter quite a lot in our technical department, uh, where uh, people sort of aren't, um, aren't really familiar with this. So um, when we're doing the discovery feature specifically, uh, that device is only going to be able to to discover endpoints on the same broadcast uh, domain. So if you have any sort of NATing devices or something like that um, between your networks, uh, then uh, or if you've subnetted, you've a large network that you've sort of subnetted, uh, what you're actually going to need to do is establish a discovery device per subnet. Um, you know, it, it, as long as it's uh, affected the same broadcast domain. Uh, so you may end up with several discovery devices on, on a larger deployment. So I'll show you how to do discovery next. Right, so back in the console, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to settings, uh, and then we are going to go to network settings. Now, um, we'll talk a little bit more about how they've structured the settings in the 
console. Uh, but right now we're looking at network settings. I'll go to my device settings here for proxy and language. So if you have a proxy server, oops, um, you would set that up uh, here. Uh, and this you can, if you, if you have, for example, one proxy server, that's fine. You just set it up there and you can always apply uh, this, uh, this settings group to all of your, all of your machines. Okay, so that's proxy and language. Um, the tabs at the top here, they're, they're not super obvious, so I imagine they might be revamped at some stage, but uh, you'll see that there are tabs at the top here. The one further to the right is the discovery tab, and this is where you're going to set up your network discovery. Um, what we have set up here is a couple of servers and a couple of workstations, uh, bearing in mind that uh, if you do have a large network that's been subnetted, um, you're effectively going to have one discovery device per, per subnet. Uh, and I would highly recommend that, even potentially in some cases, uh, two, just in case there's a problem with one of the, you know, that endpoint, maybe it's offline or something, it won't be able to do discovery jobs. Um, and what you do is you click on the Add Discovery Computer, you select the device from a deployed endpoint. You may do this uh, initially, when you're first doing a deployment, you would actually um, uh, deploy one machine first. Once that machine has been deployed, you would then actually go to the console, nominate that machine as a discovery device, and then you can do a remote deployment to the rest of your machines. So uh, the way it works now is uh, to get started, you actually need to do one manual deployment. It's up to you as a reseller how you want to do that. You could potentially like team viewer in uh, and do a deployment or, or something like that. You can even send the agent to a remote user and ask them to do a deployment. Um, but you do need to sort of just do the first device manually. Most most clients do like a server first because it's safe to assume your server will have high uptime and it's likely to be able to connect to uh, you know as many devices as possible. Uh, but bearing in mind these sort of broadcast domain limitations, so um, I, I often recommend a failover and at least one per per subnet. Great, so we've selected a device. I just selected a desktop here. Uh, what you can then do is go and configure the discovery device's search parameters. Now you can, for example, search across an IP range. If you'd like to do that, you can search across domains. Uh, I prefer to search, to leave it by default and, and search the entire network. Um, if you were running multiple customers on the same console or something like that, then you could maybe divide it up. Right. Now, you can choose to run the searches on a, a on-demand mode. So you would say run automatically, and you would say no, and there's actually an option to, uh, uh, to have it run you know, in a once-off fashion. You'll actually see that these devices are actually turned off because they're virtual devices. But this server is on and it's got a check now button. So as long as the device is available, it will um, it will be uh, uh, you know, able to run a on-demand scan. However, uh, you can also do a scheduled discovery of machines. And I highly recommend this. Because um, what we want to do is make sure that we maintain coverage of our devices. So if new devices are introduced to the network, uh, we want visibility of that. We would like to actually know uh, who's, uh, which devices have connected, who still needs protection, that kind of thing. So uh, these scans are fairly lightweight. They don't have any major impact. So I would suggest running a scan during business hours. So 11.30 is fine. Anything during with the period where the devices will be online, uh, you can actually do that. And you save it. And now Win Desktop 5 will actually discover devices uh, do a discovery scan at 11.30 every day. You could do other devices at other times if you want to just sort of really maximize your, your chance of finding, finding machines. You do get an email alert if and when a new device is discovered. So first time device is discovered, it will actually alert the administrator via, uh, uh, via email. You can also see, if I go back to the status page and I click on the list of unmanaged devices, you'll see in the right-hand column, 
this is the device that discovered it. So you'll actually see, you know, Windows Desktop 7, Windows Desktop 5, um, all that kind of stuff. They are uh, they're, they're discovering the, uh, these endpoints. Now, when you do a remote deployment, the remote deployment will use this device to deploy it to this machine. So your discovery device will be used to push out an agent to your remote machines. Cool. So um, just to check um, if there are any questions around deployment or discovery, then uh, you're welcome to drop them into the chat window. Great. All right. So the next section uh, is, uh, so we've done uh, the deployment and then discovery and coverage. The next section we're going to look at is configuration management in the ether. Okay, cool. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with the traditional platform, in the old console we actually had a mechanism of um, assigning settings profiles to groups of devices. So you would have a settings profile, whatever, servers, uh, you'd actually have a few, you'd have servers, workstations, uh, mobile devices, uh, whatever you had set up, and each of those profiles would have different configuration options depending on their use case. You would then assign that settings profile to your group of devices. So your servers profile would likely be assigned to your servers group, and your workstations to your workstations group, and so on and so forth. If you were using web filtering, you might do it by department or region or something like that. Um, so uh, it was a fairly, it was a very simple way of doing it, um, but it did require uh, a fair amount of redundancy. So in your settings profile, you would actually have to reset up your proxy, you would reset up your your discovery and cache rules and all that kind of stuff. And what we've done here is we have elected to. Um, split up common settings options. So you'll see that under proxy and language, we actually have a option to have just one proxy. You know, you're likely to just have one proxy server on your network. So there's only one uh, settings profile for this network connectivity, uh, and you would set that proxy up there. Same thing for language. I mean, I can't imagine many scenarios where you'd need multiple languages. If you did, you could create an additional profile. So all of your devices would end up with this, and I'll show you how this looks in a moment, uh, will end up with uh, you know, this one network setting. It's all that's really necessary, and you don't have to change it between different profiles. The other thing uh, that we haven't touched on, which is sort of bears on the network settings, is the cache option, um, where you're now actually able to use uh, this feature to centralize the communication of the Panda agents through a dedicated host. So uh, it's largely like a dedicated Panda proxy. Panda will use a predetermined dev uh, device or server or, or host to uh, channel all of its communication through. And uh, that way, if you have an environment where they say no internet access or you've restricted internet access, or if you just want to keep tight control of your bandwidth, then you can use this feature. Now, we did have the, the cache option before, uh, but the cache option really in the traditional platform only allowed for the, uh, the caching of uh, you know, da common data, so signature files and install files and upgrades, that kind of thing, that would be cached on the device. But uh, in the past, we weren't able to actually channel all of the communication, such as cloud queries and settings updates and that kind of thing, but now we can. So if you do have a network environment that has limited connectivity, you can use this feature. Great. Now there are other options uh, available here. So we've now split up uh, the settings into the protection settings that apply to workstations and servers. Uh, and you'll see there's always a default one which you can't can't edit. You can still do the copying of profiles. So if, if you've set up one profile with a whole bunch of rules and you'll need to create a separate one with, with you know, just a slight modification or something like that, you can actually copy it and it'll create a, you know, um, uh, a new profile. I'll just do like this. 
and it'll have all the protection settings. Now you'll notice that these protection settings, uh, it, it, it's a subset of what you had in the past with the traditional platform. So uh, this is just the uh, settings relevant to the protection. Uh, and because we're running Adaptive Defense 360, we have the advanced protection where you set your, your various modes. We obviously have the antivirus, uh, the firewall options. So this, this might change you know, between like your servers and workstations. Uh, profiles. Similar thing with device control. You might have different device control rules. Uh, web access control as well. That's a pretty important one uh, for a lot of clients. So uh, you might want to just control that. Uh, and so on and so forth with the exchange with the exchange protection modules. We'll say that you can actually see that there is a this new profile that I've just created. So it's just related to the actual protection of your your devices. Now you can still, like in the old console, assign a settings profile to your groups. So uh, I'm now looking at the computers tab. We have filtering on the left hand side here. Uh, this is filtering that allows you to filter on the property of a device, so software deployed or operating system, that kind of thing. And um, if I, for example, click on server OS, it's going to show me all the servers. You know, workstations is going to show me all the workstations, all the soft, all the devices that have Adobe Reader installed. They will be reflected here. Now you could change settings, but you probably wouldn't have a bit a good option here because you would need to go change them. Per device. So what you would do is you would go to your folder view or the My Organization view where uh, you, you've effectively got a couple of options for manually uh, segmenting our deployment uh, or you can use the Active Directory uh, option which will sort of just mirror your Active Directory structure. And what you can do here, let's go to the Windows profile, is you can drop down from the uh, this profile there are a bunch of options you can actually, a uh, bunch of uh, features you can actually use here that are quite important, but we're actually going to worry about the settings. And you'll see here, this really illustrates quite nicely how Panda has segmented the various settings options. So, like I said, your networking settings for proxy and language, you know, you only need to set that up once, maybe to my device options. Um, and then security for workstations, there's the new profile we created. We have specified this profile for this device now. Uh, and there's other options here for um, Android. And if you have patch management, uh, you can choose your patch management profile as well if you have this, if you are licensed for that module. Now, what is unique and what we didn't have in the past was we can now actually change settings on a per device level. So if I choose a device Say this one, this one for some reason has the advanced protection disabled, but that's fine. Uh, what we can actually do is you'll see that there's a tab section here. Now these tabs have a lot of information. It has some hardware information about the devices. It has some software information, so we're storing all the uh, you know, installed applications, which is how we're able to actually use that filtering feature. And then we have settings, uh, and here you can see the settings and again how they're broken up and how they can actually be applied to um, uh, uh, applied to the individual input. Um, so again, we've uh, uh, we have the option to change it from here. So even though this device is under the Windows group, uh, we're actually able to go and change its settings. Instead of the new copied profile, we can actually make this device just have the workstation settings. So you can be quite granular with the settings now. In the past, you know, you had to always create an additional profile, and create an additional group, uh, and it didn't, it didn't, uh, it limited your flexibility within a certain settings profile um, and organizational structure. Whereas nowadays, you can still structure your devices so that it, you know, maybe mirrors the organization or, like I say, mirrors your your AD setup. But you can be a lot more granular in terms of how you actually apply your settings. Uh, cool. So, patch management, we'll have a look at this. Uh, this is important because this is the next section we're going to look at, which is the actual patch management uh, uh, feature. Just a reminder, patch management is available for clients who are on the Ether platform. It is an optional module. 
So it doesn't come with any any product, but you can license it with everything from our entry level endpoint protection all the way up to our flagship adaptive defense 360. It comes with its own bunch of settings. So what you can actually do is configure how often you would like the patch management to check for updates and what class of updates uh, you'd like to have it uh, uh, look at. So I don't know if you would check your patches you know, on an hourly basis, but once a day is fine, I think, to, to get them and audit. Um, if you really had some critical infrastructure, maybe you would do it more often. Uh, we can also check for certain patches. I would generally recommend you know you do uh, your critical important and at least moderate patches. The rest of the stuff um, it's, it's sort of up to you if you if you have the the need or the bandwidth that kind of thing. Cool. What's really cool about these these settings views is you also have the option to see which devices are affected by the by the settings. So you can actually click on the view devices and will show you who's got what patch Quite a lot. There's, well, there's only one profile, so of course everybody has those patch management options. Now, um, so now we've set up our patch management. Uh, we've set it up so that uh, we're checking daily for uh, you know, the majority of patches, uh, and we would actually to track that and see the output. Is we would go to the status page, and we would have a look at the patch management section. So on the left hand side, there, if you are licensed for patch management, you click on that. Uh, it's now going to give me a breakdown of my network in terms of my patching status. So, um, <laughs> again, the, there are errors in the uh, demo console because it's sort of done that way by design. So you can actually see how we report on the status of your devices. And what's really nice is the devices can individually report. They're not re re you know, reliant on any sort of local uh, infrastructure to do so. So even if these devices are spread out throughout the world, uh, you actually have the visibility to see what their patch status is, regardless of where they where they are. Cool. So we've got the status of our devices. Uh, we can also see that uh, where there are problem areas, for example, we're checking daily for patches, but there are some devices here that haven't communicated for uh, sorry, a number of days. So there's a whole bunch that haven't booted up for a week or so. Maybe it's the time of year, I'm not really sure, but uh, uh, you can actually click on this and it'll show you where devices may be out of date. Patching, especially in a Microsoft context, generally only happens once a month anyway. So, um, you know, I wouldn't worry too much about that, but if you had devices in the 30 day section, that's where I would sort of uh, raise a red flag. Cool. Looking down in terms of your patch availability, you can actually see here that we've broken up this section based on the patch class. Uh, so critical would probably be where you would want to start your, your efforts. So we click on critical, and the first thing you'll notice is that there's a long list of outstanding patches, yes, but uh, you'll also notice that they're not just Microsoft patches. Okay, you can see Java, there's a Firefox, another Java update. What else have we got? Another Firefox update. So the uh, patch management platform supports third-party patching as well. So you can not only maintain your uh, uh, patching posture from a Microsoft perspective, but also from a third-party uh, perspective as well. Uh, under the support section on the website, we do have a list of all the supported vendors. That's literally hundreds. Uh, we can do all of the, the common and generally freely available software uh, on the internet. So all of your web browsers, all of your common frameworks, uh, all that kind of stuff, and any sort of common media applications uh, with known security vulnerabilities, we track and you can actually update those here. Now, there's no local infrastructure required, so you don't need to have a WSUS type implementation or some other kind of third-party uh, uh, patching service. Uh, the caching of all the patches and the downloading of all the patches does get managed by the actual agents, and the patches are automatically peered across the network. So the agents create an ad hoc peer-to-peer -peer network, and they will actually share common files between the various devices. So from a bandwidth perspective, um, you know, very little overhead, but you do get absolute simplicity when it comes to a, a patch.
catching product. Way simpler to use than WSUS or any other sort of uh, third party uh, patching solution. Definitely the easiest, easiest patching option to use. And also no setup. So we just license this for you. Uh, if you really have a deployment, uh, immediately you will get an audit of all your devices. So you will know within a day or so uh, how effective your current patch management application is. And if you just want to know that, uh, you're more than welcome to contact me, ask for a trial, we'll set it up, and you can actually just get a sneak peek into how good your patching actually is. So highly recommend that if you if you get the chance. Um, and then from there, you can actually perform your remedial action. Now, when you perform remedial action, uh, there's a task section, and you'll actually see that the patches are uh, run as, as various tasks. You can see this is a task for patching uh, Internet Explorer 11, uh, and it affects six devices that obviously we have an issue, and you can go and view which six devices uh, we, had, we had there. Uh, if the task is actually um, active, it will show you what the, uh, what the status is. There are other things such as scheduled scans that, uh, that get reflected here. Great stuff. So we've covered quite a lot of ground in this section. We've looked at uh, the deployment of the product, where to get the agent and how to get started. Um, something I didn't cover earlier that's quite relevant is that the licensing has changed in the Ether platform. So in the past, you had to purchase things like your Mac OS licenses separately. But nowadays, it's one license per device. And whatever devices are supported, you can actually install those into the console. So you can download your agents here, or you can use the discovery and remote deployment uh, functionality, uh, which you can you can then do do here, and you can actually select oh sorry select and push out your uh, push out your agents here. Uh, we've also looked at how to set up the discovery, so that will be under network settings and the discovery tab where you will configure your discovery devices. We also had a look at the structure of how we've put together the settings nowadays uh, by separating out common settings options and then um, uh, giving you more granular functionality in terms of applying settings to actual endpoints. Uh, and then lastly, patch management, uh, where uh, we looked at how the patch management module works, how simple and easy it is to use, how you would actually patch your devices, uh, as well as sort of monitor their patching status. Great. So, if there are any questions, I didn't see any any questions in the chat, which is which is totally fine. You're more than welcome to follow up afterwards uh, regarding uh, if you'd like to do a trial of patch management, or if you have any technical questions around uh, doing the deployments, then you're more than welcome to contact the support department. Um, I will link it around a little bit. If there are any questions, please drop them into the chat window, and I will do my best to best to answer them. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much for attending. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hopefully see you next. Okay, no questions, that's great. Thanks for joining the session, guys. Uh, the session will be recorded, so we will publish that a bit later on. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day.